it in about a half an hour at noon. And in a little bit, we'll walk you through how to go about voting in case you don't um, haven't looked at that yet. Uh, I will say this about the vote. Once you do vote, we can't change your vote. So make sure when you get in there to vote that you are informed and that you know exactly how you want to vote because there will be no changing of the vote after you vote. Um, also this week, we're doing the virtual town hall today. Tomorrow we head to Philadelphia. Actually, we head there tonight. Tomorrow we have the Philadelphia base visit. Then we'll be back here in Dallas uh, for Thursday's town hall in Dallas. And then Friday, we will be in Los Angeles for a town hall there. So busy week. So we want to get started here today. Today, we're going to focus on reserve, satellites, the implementation schedule, and we're going to go to the calculators that are on the website for you to use. And we're going to walk through uh, the calculator, the trip comparison calculator today. And a little bit later after the vote opens, we'll go to the website also and just walk you through how to vote. Uh, should be pretty simple, but just want to make sure everybody understands how to do that. So let's get started here and let's head right into our reserve section. So I think, Wendy, you're going to start us off, right? Yes. So a question we've received is, did reserve guarantee increase? The answer is no, it did not. And part of the reason for that is if we have a reserve guarantee increase, the company wanted reserve call out of time increase. And we know the members did not want that. So some of the items that do go above guarantee, which will help help offset that reserve guarantee that have been added to this TA are TTS and UBL pick up on days off. If you have less than seven days, so if you have six days or less, any of that additional pay for vacation, their 30 minutes will go above uh, in, and into your pay, no credit. So today it's three and a half for vacation pay and, and credit. In this TA, it is four hours pay and three and a half hours credit. So that additional 30 minutes, if you have six or day less days, will go into pay no credit. Wendy, before I move on, let's yep. talk about it for just a second. So when you're on, you know you're going to be on reserve, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and you bid your vacation. If you bid six days or less, then you get your full 12 days off, yeah. right? And so most of our reserve flight attendants today know bid, bid six. those six days or less in order to get the full value of your days off while you're on reserve. Yeah. So you'd have 18 days off. So then now if you hold six days of vacation, you're going to get three hours above guarantee uh, once TH 2024 is passed. In comparison to today, we don't get that, right? Okay. Correct. Another uh, boarding pay will also go above guarantee any sit rig or any hotel penalty pay. Um, this is in addition to what we already received today above um, guarantee, which is premium VE or training pay. Great. All right. So why was straight reserve increased by a year? And it is increased for those flight attendants who come who are hired after the implementation, which is the programming of adding an additional year of straight reserve. We wanted to make sure that new hires coming through training would know what exact uh, rotation they will be starting under. Um, and the reason why we added another year or part of the reason is we heard from the membership lower the reserve seniority or those that <laughs> reserve. And in order to do that, somebody else has to serve it. So adding an additional year to those coming on property is part of that. High seniority reserve bases. This is to address um, today, it's Phoenix and LA, that we will have as APFA requests and uh, the company must meet at a high level to discuss methods on how to reduce the seniority at those high reserve bases. And this means that it wouldn't change rotation at those bases, but it's how can we get transfers into those bases? And it's a not a meeting with your base president and the uh, base manager. This is high level at the company who actually can do something about this and have those discussions. Let's be honest about this. When it comes to um, the high seniority bases, okay? 
this is not something that is negotiated in a contract. We don't negotiate staffing levels in a contract for each base. That's done by the base presidents. And in situations like this, this is going to be engagement with top management on a consistent basis. And then also, you know, we're doing everything we can to help that base and to improve the system. But for negotiations, we don't negotiate staffing levels of a base, of a certain base. That's not part of negotiations, never has been. So, and lastly on this slide, reserve VLOL, VLOA will no, not receive reserve credit. So if someone who's supposed to be on reserve is taking a VLOA, somebody else is having to re do reserve. And so that keeps the reserve seniority higher. So again, trying to lower the reserve seniority. I'd say this also when we were negotiating for like you talked about the one year straight being added. We have so many different opinions up from 28,000 members about what we should do with the reserve system, right? And we looked at the surveys and we did see there were a lot of people who wanted a change, but they didn't want to go to straight reserve, right? And we we knew that especially we've been talking to our base presidents quite a bit about all this. They also did not want um, for flight attendants who are currently on the property to be changing for them, it, for it to change for them. So we had a lot of different opinions on how to fix this reserve system. And the one year straight, I would say probably was the majority was we want something different, but we know we don't, don't want this. So. How did reserve fitting PBS improve? So uh, the one thing that we added to PBS is for reserves to be able to bid a block of days off. I don't care where in the month they are. I just want five, six days, however many, so that either I can take a vacation or I can um, pick up trips. So this is a non-date specific. Just give me five or six days off anywhere in the month. Okay. All right. What was done to protect reserves days off? So the first thing that we did is reserves will no longer report on their flex day. Um, when you have a flex day following your last day of reserve and your wrap, you'll have to report for the sequence that you're assigned by 2359 on your last day of reserve. Um, we also guaranteed reinstatement of days off um, with the guaranteed day off will be on the opposite end of the block of days that it came from. Um, Slide. Uh -oh. <laughs> Looking up. Well, let me back up. Okay. What was done on. to improve reserves <laughs> days off? All right, let's start with that. Um, all right. So that's why you were at, a little confused on it. Wait a minute. This is the wrong slide. <laughs> so um, we added reserves into TTSUBL. This will also include red flag. Um, those the trips that they pick up will be for pay no credit on their days off and the legalities and parameters are gonna match um, the ETB parameters. We did have to move up the release on the last day off two hours in order to accommodate the FAR, which increased from eight to 10 hours um, during this contract. So we added that in to that. And then we also um, had to put in a TTS max, um, which is 30 hours to get from 85 to 115. So that way um, reserves have a TTS max, just like blind holders do. We also improved the ability for reserves to trade days off with the company. It's gonna be a balloting system. Um, the ballots will be collected and processed in seniority order each day until two days prior to the date requested, kind of how TTS runs. Um, it's gonna be in seniority order. That way that, so, cause today it's a first come first serve system and you hope to get scheduling at a good time when you can get your day off and that's not fair. So this way you can just kind of set it and forget it and um, crew scheduling will process it each day until two days prior. We also added in um, last sequence, last series pay protection for reserves. So line holders are probably very familiar with this pay protection, um, but reserves, it was always a fight to get this. So what we've done is when there are no more reserve days for the month, um, you've either called out a time or you completed your last reserve sequence and all you have left are days off or release days. And then you pick up either through ETB or TTS UBL um, and something goes awry with that sequence that you picked up, you'll be eligible for LSP protection. 
Perfect. Thanks. Uh, I know I hear all the time from our reserves. They're really excited to finally get to pick up through TTS and UBL, too. and especially yep. to have access to Red Flag. Yep, fine. Exactly. All right. All right. So what was done to protect reserves? <laughs> Here we go. So like I said, um, you'll no longer have to report on your flex day. You'll have to report by 2359 um, on your last day of reserve. We also guaranteed reinstatement of days off. So um, when you're flown into your flex day or your golden day and you're trying to get that day off reinstated in the month, today it's based on mutual agreement with crew scheduling. And if you can't come to an agreement, then you either accept the day they are willing to give you or you have to forfeit the day off and be paid the value of the reserve day above your guarantee. Um, but for those that want, you know, days off are precious on reserve. So if you have 12 days off and you're counting on 12 days off, um, you want to make sure you get that day reinstated. You're now guaranteed the day off returned on the opposite end. So if you were off Wednesday to Friday, but you were flown into your Wednesday, you're guaranteed the Saturday off. You can request a different day off in the month if a different day works for you, but you do still have to get that mutual agreement from crew scheduling. If you don't though, and you still want those three days off in a row, you can get that Saturday. Um, we also changed how Rota D is going to process. Um, so today, Rota D bunches um, reserves that it is assigning into, uh, sorry, this is for Rota. So this is, we changed how Rota is going to process. Sorry, the slide should say Rota processing. Um, so Rota today bunches those that are available for um, in. <laughs> it's okay. Rhoda assigns groupings of those that have a sequence for the next day or they have one flex day the next day. It adds, it sponges them into the same group. And so they're treated equally. And so what we've done is we've separated them out. And so those that have a Rhoda assignment will be assigned first because they're still on reserve days. That's why they have a Rhoda assignment before those that have a flex day. So this way we're protecting those that have a flex day. They'll be processed after those that have reserve um, days on. It's all a little complicated, yeah. so it's okay. <laughs> I think and the processing of right, Rhoda right, and Rhoda D, yeah. we looked at a lot to try and see what we can make changes to, to help make sure that our flight attendants who have a flex day, that they are not assigned into that flex day. And so we changed some of the processing to help with that is the basic of it. Right, exactly. Um, and so this is a chart, this isn't um, new information, but we did summarize and add this into the contract so that it would be really easy to see um, how you're work on your days off is going to play. So you can look on the left to see all of that and then how it all plays out onto your days off and when it's pay and when it's pay no credit. So how did reserve bidding in Rhoda and Rhoda D improve? We talked about PBS already. So this is some reserve bidding in Rhoda and Rhoda D. So first um, we got an agreement from the company that they will redistribute open time only until noon home base time. So Rota run starts running at 1500. And so trips that are in Rota for bidding for the following day in open time between noon and 1500 are going to be the trips that are going to be processed by Rota. So this is a huge improvement because today they don't have this noon restriction. They can redistribute open time at any time. And so you might be in there at 1400 thinking you're bidding for the trips for tomorrow and they end up at 1430 moving all those trips to another base because they look at staffing and realize they don't have enough reserves to cover those trips. So now we know that by noon, those trips are going to stay in that base. There is a stipulation that in extenuating circumstances, they can move them out, but um, that has to be something big. So they can't just do it at any time like they could today. Um, also starting at noon is all of the information for the Rota run is going to be available so that reserves bidding and Rota are going to be able to see all of that. So they'll be able to know um, how many flex days everybody else on being run through Rota has so they can see if there's um, how open and closed groups are going to work. And the most important thing is you'll know what standby shifts are going to need to be filled. So today you can only bid for standby shifts 
um, using generic properties. You're trying to guess based on which standby shifts were filled yesterday and the report times of those sh shifts. Um, and instead, it's going to be pretty black and white, which standby shifts are going to be filled, how many reserves are needed, what days are needed for those shifts. Um, and you'll just be able to really easily bid for standby shift A. You'll know exactly what you're bidding on instead of trying to guess using the generic parameters. In Rota D, um, the change that we made is that the first UVL run will happen, and then within 60 minutes, Rota D is going to run. Today, the process is that Rota D should be run immediately following the first UVL run. And we heard a lot from line holders that this was really frustrating because they were then bidding on trips that were being assigned to reserves because they waited to see the, UV, the trip in UVL. And by that time, it had already been immediately processed through Rota D. And as Wendy mentioned earlier, we are our approach to the changes that we made in reserve in a lot of ways was to reduce the company's reliance on reserves and therefore bring down the reserve percentages. So if there is a line holder who's willing to work a trip, but a reserve was assigned to that trip, we want to try to get that line holder to have access to that trip and to then eventually not need that reserve to cover that trip. So that was the main reason for this change as we heard a lot from line holders. There are um, some parameters around that, though, because we also don't want to be forcing our reserves into minimum call out all the time. So the main parameter is that um, it'll be run within 60 minutes, but if the trip opens with three hours or less in a non-co-terminal or four hours or less in a co-terminal, it'll still go the, through that immediate processing. So for the most part, um, three hours non-co-terminal, four hours co-terminal to give you that two to three hours of minimum call out in those um, respective bases. And um, we also wanted to put a stipulation in for the overnight trips that open. So between midnight and 5 a.m. trips that open that depart after 11 a.m. So early afternoon or evening trips, um, they can be held until 7 a.m. Again, to give line holders the chance to wake up look at open time, decide if they wanted to pick up one of those trips out of UVL before it's processed through reserves. But again, it has to depart in the afternoon or evening because we don't want our reserves to be getting minimum call out for early morning reports. So trying to balance um, what we heard, the feedback we heard from our line holders with the feedback we also heard from reserves and try to put some real um, timelines in the contract about when Rota D has to be run following UVL. All right. Um, how is the ASG indicator approved? So nobody calls it that. It's called click, right? Um, so the um, clicks were improved. So we now are going to be getting clicks for everything, all assignments and awards from Rota and Rota D. So the main um, improvement there is Rota. Today you don't get any clicks from Rota. So now anything you get from Rota, whether it's an assignment or an award, you'll get a click. Um, and then the main improvement in Rota D is for aggressive. So if you bid aggressively in Rota D, you'll still get clicks for it, whereas today you do not. Um, we also are going to get clicks for each calendar day of the sequence, including um, when it carries over into a new month. This was frequently heard from our reserves who do back-to-back -back reserve months. They are getting, you know, a four-day trip on the last day of the first reserve month, going into their second reserve month, working three days in that new month, but not having any clicks to show for it. So now your clicks are going to match the days um, of the calendar day, and they'll also carry over into the new month. And we did get the company to agree that um, clicks are going to be um, matching the calendar days as they were assigned or awarded from our reserve systems. But you may request to have the clicks adjusted if the actual days flown differ from the original sequence. Today, you don't have that option. So if your three day trip turns into a four day, you can request to have an additional click added. Similarly, if your three day trip turns into a two day, you can request to have your click removed if you would like. That's up to you. So I would say when you're on reserve, yes. everybody has a strategy yeah. pretty much. That's true. And yep. so in a sense, some of the changes that we've made here are for our reserves to be able to strategize what's gonna work best for them mm -hmm. in the month, right? The clicks were definitely something we heard from our flight attendants that, hey, I'm bidding in Rota, I've got 70 hours, but I have no clicks, yep. right? And so at the end of the month, 
you know, the strategy they had planned, it doesn't help them yep. when at the end of the month, that's when they were getting the row to D assignment. Yep. So that, as well as the aggressive hours and that change to how the aggressive hours are awarded, I think definitely for our reserves, we'll be able to strategize better on how, how they can make the most of that reserve money yep. for them. And especially getting around like, there are certain times that maybe you can work that day, but you need to get in by 10 o'clock in the morning. You can bid aggressive that day and try and get a trip that gets you in early um, so that you can make whatever you have, uh, your party for your son or whatever it may be, uh, you know, uh, so that it works for you. Absolutely. Okay, so how did RAP D improve? Um, big key or marker to this is that uh, um, by the changes that we have made to to RAP D, this will help um, alleviate a lot of the assignments that were going into the RAP D pool for trips that should have actually been assigned out of the RAP A. So that um, 0400 um, check in now, then some bases that you may have 0500 um, will some will be alleviated um, a, a good deal. Um, a key point to this is that as um, the wraps vary uh, predominantly from base to base, wrap D is going to be um, from two to two um, home base time. Um, and um, as Reese uh, mentioned earlier, um, the time uh, at 11.59 home base time on the last day of reserve block um, that, uh, that will, uh, if you have going into a flex day, that will end there. Um, once uh, all the departures are airborne and scheduling is confirmed that there are no known diversions or flights that may be returning back to the field, um, the wrap can be modified to end. Um, so it may end prior to the 2 a.m. period, which is huge for us. That's all new. Um, so that, that's a huge benefit going forward for us. Um, Brian, I'm going to add in here a little bit because we got this question and one of the questions that was submitted ahead of time. And they um, talked about basically that the other reps don't have contractual times and they never have had contractual times that A, B, C have to start. It depends on the base, right? And that's how it's been throughout this contract. Rat D, we were actually, when we started negotiating, we were trying to remove the fourth rat. That was our intent. And really what we ended up doing is trying to figure out, you know, what was the biggest concern uh, for the flight attendants. And really there are a lot of flight attendants who do like RAP D um, because they want to be on RAP D at night, but they were getting those early four o'clock, five o'clock in the morning sign-ins. So once we were able to identify that and actually get the data that showed that's what RAP D was getting, that's how we were able to make this change. So I think that, you know, I just want to make sure that everybody realized the other wrap times were never contractual as far as what, when their start times were. Um, it always has been, it depends on, you know, the base and what works for that base. Correct. And it's really just been, you, you our bases now, our, our departures are pretty much banked out in various um, times. So as Julie mentioned, your base could have um, a heavy bank in the morning compared to another one that's um, mid afternoon. So those wrap times are gonna be adjusted slightly accordingly. All right, how was standby improved? So um, the first thing that we did is we changed how reserves are going to be, or standbys are gonna be assigned um, their legalities. So today, standby legalities are based off of the sequence report time, um, which becomes a problem for early morning standby shifts that are four to six hours that are then getting like late morning assigned trips. Their legalities for their day are going to be longer than if they had gotten an early morning stamp, uh, sequence. And so it was really complicated. It was confusing. Um, you were looking at all sorts of different charts. So what we've done is we've standardized it and it's just gonna, st standby legalities are gonna be based on the standbys report time instead of the sequences report time. We also changed how standby is going to pay and credit. Um, today, an issue that we have is standbys that are assigned halfway through their standby shift to a sequence that has been delayed and maybe even reported prior to the start of their standby shift, even though that standby had been sitting three, four hours in their shift, they weren't getting any standby pay and credit for that time because today the contract reads that you're going to be earning standby pay and credit until the report time of the sequence 
that you're assigned. Well, if the report time was before you even showed up to standby, you're not getting any paying credit for standby. So um, we recognize that and fixed it, and you're now going to, um, it's going to be based on the departure time. The report time is going to be based on the departure time at the time of the assignment. So if it's a 5 a.m. scheduled departure that is now delayed until 8 a.m., and that's when you as a standby gets it, um, it's going to be a 7 a.m. report for that known 8 a.m. departure. And so you'll get standby pay and credit from the start of your standby shift until 7 a.m. for that known departure of 8 a.m., um, which is the improvement there. We also, and I talked about this a little bit earlier for um, rota bidding, is there's going to be a specific identifier for standby shifts. So today, in order to bid for standby, you're using a generic parameter is trying to fit guess how the parameters you're using are going to adjust to the standby shift that you're trying to bid for based on what was awarded yesterday and there's no consistency. Um, and so now the standby shifts are going to be published. You're going to know exactly which standby shift is going to be starting and ending, how many days it's needed for, which base it's going to or terminal it's going to be in. Um, and so it'll just be identified. This is standby shift A. You know what you're getting yourself into. This is standby shift B. You know what you're getting yourself into. And it'll make it much easier to bid on um, in Rota and Rota D. All right, Wendy, I think you're going to talk about LMCO. Yep. So how will the new LMCO UBL affect reserve? So LMCO stands for less than minimum call out. And today, when a sequence remains open or becomes open with less than two hours or three hours at a code terminal base, typically it's assigned to a standby first. And then we do have a reserve LMCO. So standbys have to be depleted first, and then it could go to an aggressive reserve with an LMCO bid. What this TA has added is line holders and reserves on days off will also be able to ballot for a less than minimum call out sequence. So again, if a trip opens or is remaining open with less than two hours or three hours at a code terminal, a line holder or reserve on day off will go first. If that trip remains open after that, it will go to a line holder or reserve on day off out of base. If it still remains open, it's not filled, it'll go to LMCO reserve aggressive. And if it's still open, then it will go to a standby. So again, we're trying to allow flight attendants the option to pick up these trips before they're assigned to reserves. And I would say this is all trying to reduce the reserve reliance yeah. uh, percentages at each base. I know every flight attendant here gets a base brief, but they see how many flight attendants we have on reserve. And we've consistently tried to, throughout these negotiations, figure out how we can basically lower the reserve percentage. And this is one of the ways that we can do that. So how did we improve going aggressive? Um, currently, as you know, your um, first 40 hours um, are associated to time picked up through Road to Road to D. Um, if you start the month with vacation, um, jury duty, um, items like that, that time is included into your 40 hours. So, what we've done is taken the aggressive hours and have pulled them separately. So you start out with, say, vacation. Um, you have 20 hours coming into the month of vacation. That time is going in there. But if you go into an aggressive trip and pick that time up, that time only applies to your 40 hours of aggressive. So you could obtain 40 hours through Rota, Rota D, or through jury duty, um, vacation and such. However, any time that you pick up and through aggressive up to 40 hours will apply as a separate item. And then those are combined together. Um, once you hit that 40 hours of aggressive, it goes back to what we currently experience now, that any time beyond that 40 hours will go above your reserve cop. So Brian, in the future, when I pick up in Rhoda, let's say I'm good for the first five days of the month and I pick up 30 hours in Rhoda, Will that go towards my aggressive hours tomorrow? No. Right. That's the difference. That's a big difference, right? Today, you might be wanting to time out, but you also want some flexibility with those aggressive hours, especially when you didn't get a trip in Rota, right? So now you can work, you can pick up in Rota 40, 50 hours, and then you can use those aggressive hours, that aggressive bid to yeah, try out. Yeah, and get the trips you want in Rota D. Correct. Yeah.
Are there any new ways to earn pay and credit? So this is probably a reserve similar to my strategy on reserve. We talked about how there's a different strategy. Some of it wants to time out. So um, earning pay and credit, you're trying to hustle. You're trying to get um, timed out as quickly as you can. Um, and we have some new ways to do that. Um, the first is going to be um, reserve removal. So it's it's new language that is related to when a reserve is given minimum call out um, to departure. They take their two to three hours to get to the airport, um, but the flight has departed without that reserve. Now the reserve will be placed on standby um, to earn pay and credit. The standby shift length is going to be the remainder of the wrap that that standby was on or that reserve was on um, unless the wrap time left was more than six hours. So if they got called in, they were on wrap A, it was two to two in their base. They were called at 8 a.m. They get to the airport at 10 a.m. because they took their two hours. Um, there are four hours left in their standby in their wrap, so they'll be placed on standby for four hours. Um, but now you're earning pay and credit, whereas today you go back on wrap. You may or may not hear from scheduling again. A lot of these reserves end up getting lost, which then increases our reserve percentages because we're not using our reserves efficiently. Um, and more frustratingly, when this would happen, um, and what we heard from reserves is that you're now just not earning any pain credit and you got to the airport, you're dressed, you're ready to go. Um, so that was really frustrating. Or you also could be released by crew scheduling if they realize that they don't need you, which is always a nice bonus when you get released by crew scheduling. Um, similar to this is when a flight is delayed or canceled. Um, the reserve is with a the crew. They're going to be rescheduled just like the rest of the crew. But if they're not rescheduled and the reserve is at the airport, ready to go, wants to work, um, they can elect to be placed on standby. If the rest of the crew is released and the reserve wants to be released, they can go home, no problem. But if you're somebody that is hustling, um, maybe you're a commuter, you don't have a hotel room for the night, so getting released um, actually would be harder for you to do, you can elect to be placed on standby and try one more time to get um, a trip. And again, being placed on standby is earning you pay and credit towards timing out. Um, we also added in the option for reserves to request to extend their standby shift. So you were on your standby shift, it's now ended, um, but you want the option to maybe keep working or get, get a trip. Um, you can ask crew scheduling to extend your standby shift. For a so if you were on a four hour shift, you could go to a six hour shift. If you're on a six hour shift, you could go to an eight hour shift. Um, that one does have to happen with crew scheduling approval, but if you're in um, a base or if there's weather happening um, in the system, then they might agree to do that. And again, you're going to be earning that paying credit towards timing out. Can we also just reiterate for anybody who's trying to <laughs> the different ways uh, that you're going to be able to get paid above guarantee? Sure. We went over at the beginning, but just for those who tune in late. Yeah, um, so we have some new ways that people can earn pay no credit. Um, that's going to be boarding pay, uh, so this new sit time rig, the TTS UPL on your days off, the new hotel penalty pay, and then also the new or the change that we made to how vacation, um, the new pay for vacation, it's 30 minutes. So all vacation days are going to pay four hours, but that 30 minutes, if you're, if the vacation block is less than six days and it's your reserve month, that 30 minutes is going to pay above guarantee as well. Why is out of base standby trending? So if you're looking at the red line of the uh, TA, it looks like out of base standby is new language. It's not. It's the same language that is currently in section 13, which is TDY only for reserve. Uh, this is language that came over in the JCBA from LUS. We've never seen it used and can't imagine it ever being used. Um, so it's it's just in case, right? It's just in case language. Yeah. <laughs> and the TDY assignments are for one week, two weeks, or the full bid month. The out of base single assignment and out of base reserve standby would be one specific time that uh, versus uh, a, a weekly or a monthly requirement in the TDY. Okay. Does that make sense? Yep. And satellite, we're getting a couple of questions about satellites, so I just wanted to highlight the changes and know that anytime we're looking at 
changes to a section. We go to the base presidents to hear their concerns, but this team also had a meeting with the satellite coordinators, gosh, at, back in 2022, which seems like forever ago. And I think we had about six coordinators on and we really listened to their concerns and um, problems they're seeing in the satellites. And, uh, and what we learned is that the satellite coordinators are felt like they're offered and doing the job of crew schedule, which isn't the intent of the language. And every satellite base had a different way of covering open trips, be it a group email, a group chat, texting. So that seemed to be a little problematic on how flight attendants in the satellite knew what the trips were. So I, um, the new language for mutual agreement um, to open a new satellite base, um, it is mutual agreement. And today the company has sole discretion. And similarly, if uh, a satellite base is going to close, the current language says the whole satellite agreement would have to be ended. So that isn't wasn't the intent that we thought should be there. So those two changes were made. Um, the electronic notification system will be used to notify satellite flight attendants when the trips become open. And this also goes back to the satellite coordinators who felt like they were doing the job of crew schedule when trips open, and that what shouldn't be the case. This also is going to be part of the kick. Um, implementing and when it's implemented and how it's going to look because it touches two things. It touches how what the process is in UBL and it's also going to touch the electronic notification system. So we don't have those details worked out yet, but um, those will be coming. Also, the new language in 10U6E for ETB will have a separate tab for satellite based trips. So currently in ETB, you can sort by satellite, but it's maybe a little confusing for some if I'm just searching for trips in my in Chicago and and I can't see if some of those trips are Minneapolis, which is our satellite. So we just want to make it clearer for all flight attendants uh, to not mistakenly pick up a satellite trip, but make it also uh, easier for satellite flight attendants in the satellite to find the trips that are open. And uh, questions, the new satellite language says easiest will be used to notify satellite flight attendants when they open, who will get the notification and when. And like I just said, this is going to be processed. The intent is that the satellite flight attendants would get that notification. And we're not sure, would it be something I opt into? Um, Most but, likely, right? Most likely it's going to be something those satellite flight attendants will opt into. The entire base isn't going to want to get a notification of a satellite, right? right? Every right. The time it opens up. So. And then all flight tents would know that. Hopefully that's taking the workload off the satellite coordinator where the satellite coordinator would just be assisting for minute. last minute yeah. issues. And second question, could a satellite flight attendant or could a flight attendant picking up out of base get a satellite trip before an in-base flight attendant? No, because without a base flying, in base will always get the trip first. If no one in base uh, was awarded a trip, then it would go uh, out of base would have the opportunity to pick it up. OK, I think that's everything. I think that's everything. OK, yeah. I just had the flight attendant I flew in with yesterday asked, is there any new satellites on the horizon? Um, he lives in Nashville. <laughs> so he, he was definitely wanting, hoping for one of those. We used to have a base in Nashville quite a long time ago. All right, we're going to move on to implementation. Uh, the implementation schedule got posted last week and um, we had been working on it for a few weeks after the agreement. So we we're still continuing to negotiate the date and negotiate basically over the language that we had in that. Uh, it wasn't something that the company just decided, hey, it's going to take you know this long for this. It was definitely even throughout negotiations. We were meeting with the IT department and talking to IT about the viability of what we were negotiating for and how long these items would take to get implemented. So you may have the first question we have on here is, is why do the six items in the implementation letter not have dates for implementation? And those six items all revolve around TTS and UBL improvements. And they actually have a date of 
the KIC, our new contract implementation committee, which I'm getting lots of flight attendants raising their hands saying they want to be a part of, um, they, the KIC is going to work on a timeline for those in the first 90 days after the agreement is ratified, okay? And the reason for that on those items are, this is adding six major items into a current system we have. And we need to prioritize. What do we want first? How large are each of those items to program? How long will they take? So we need to have more conversations around that before we can prioritize what's going to go in first. They also have to take into consideration um, when they're looking at this. If it's a really large item that it's going to take longer to implement, they might add in some of the smaller items first. So even though they don't have date of signing or date of signing plus six months, the KIC will have 90 days to work on this with the company and see all everything that needs to be looked at before they make that timeline for those six items. The next question we have is what happens if boarding pay or sit rig pay are not programmed by six months after date of signing? Those are hard, firm dates. They are not dates of, you know, possibly we'll get it done in six months. When we negotiated this language, the negotiations around boarding pay and sit rig, and I, the value, but the dollars that we got from that delayed implementation went back into wages, went back into other items that we were able to achieve in this contract. It is not a flimsy date. It's not a targeted timeline date. It is a hard, fast date that they have to get them done. And if they are not automated by that time frame, then they will have to do it manually. I'm sure you can imagine they do not want to do it manually. Uh, and so they will definitely be working on that to get it done as soon as they can. Um, but definitely within those that six months. Is there a penalty pay of items if items on the implementation timeline are not implemented as specified? So we have a process uh, for the other items. I'm not going to be, this is not about the 401k, this is not about boarding pay, and this is not about sit rate, because those are hard, fast dates that they have to be done. And that was part of the negotiations. Um, but the rest of the items that have date of signing plus six months, date of signing plus 12 months, okay? Those items, we do have a process here through our SBA department where we can grieve if those items are not in. Those are targeted timelines. They're realistic timelines. That's what we had been working on for those couple of weeks to make sure that the timelines we had in there were something that the company could meet. And so there is not a penalty as far as that is concerned, but we do still have the grievance process available to us. We also mo modeled this implementation timeline after the pilot's implementation timeline that they have. Um, I just spoke with the pilot union this week and they are happy to report to me uh, that they have gotten quite a few of their items already in ahead of schedule. So I was really happy to hear that the same person who is working on their implementation is going to be working on our implementation. So it, it sounds like it's going very well over there for the pilots. Why does it take so long for things to be implemented? Oh, this is a question I definitely um, feel and um, can sympathize with everybody. Listen, programming doesn't start until this uh, tentative agreement is ratified. They have been talking about each of these items and we've been talking with them about the logistics of how long it will take, but they don't actually start programming until the TA is actually ratified because if it wasn't ratified, some of these items might not be in there and it'd be time wasted for them. And so uh, programming, is it's not just about programming, it is also about testing it. So if you remember back with the implementation of many of the items that we had uh, with our last agreement, there is a testing period that you want to make sure that they go through so that you have less glitches. I'm not gonna say no glitches this time, but less glitches when it's actually out for the flight attendants and we're, we're using it. So I understand, we all understand the angst over the implementation timeline, but regardless, these items uh, are going to take time to program uh, that we have in there with the targeted timelines. And um, no matter what happens, as far as the vote is concerned, they still are gonna require that amount of time to program. 
So did I catch everything, Tim, on that one? So, all right, all right. All right, let's move on to our trip calculator. Josh, actually, can we go to the website? Absolutely. And is the vote open? It is. Yay. Okay, how's it going? Oh, it's going great. No issues. No issues. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. All right, let's see here. Okay. Working. Looks good. Looks like our flight attendants are in and are voting. So let's go first to the website before we start talking about these, the trip calculator, and let's just kind of walk them through how you vote and what you do. Okay. Sure. All right, so from the APFA website, um, all you need to do is, well, let me refresh the screen because this is from earlier. So you're just going to hit click here. It's going to take you to the main page for the tentative agreement where you can obviously look at more information, um, watch the videos. But once you're ready to vote, all you're going to do is uh, click the button that says vote here. You're going to log in. Um, if you have any issues logging in, you can hit forget your password and uh, you'll go through a couple steps to email a link to reset your password. Once you log in, you'll be uh, directed directly to your ballot where you'll make your selection on uh, the, the vote. Um, make sure you read the information clearly before you hit next. So you'll hit next and then um, you'll have a verification. Uh, if you need to change or you click the wrong button, you can hit back and then uh, change it. And one thing really to remember is that once you hit the submit ballot button, you are not mm -hmm. able to go back in and change your vote. Okay, pretty easy. Nothing is going to come to you in the mail. All right, okay. I know I've heard people like, I haven't received anything yet. You're not gonna get anything in the mail. You're just gonna go to APFA.org, yep. uh, log in, and you're gonna vote right there. And then um, you will receive an email confirmation immediately upon voting as well. Perfect. Yeah. All right, so let's go to the calculators. Let's just first show we've got, uh, can you just stay hovered over calculators for a second there just so they can see as they're choosing. So we've got a wage comparison calculator. We've got boarding pay examples, boarding pay calculator, retro pay calculator, trip comparison, calculator and then the 401k calculator. I think we just added the 401k calculator last week. And Josh, can we go to the trip comparison calculator? Sure. Now, the trip comparison calculator is um, a little different. It is, we have a flight attendant. Uh, I believe he's based in Los Angeles, right? David Harshaw, who had done this on his own. I think this was like in the first day or two, right? He uh worked on the calculator and we saw it all over social media and so we got a hold of him and he was able to help us uh get the calculator on our website so i can see josh are you having trouble it looks a little different okay. hang on compare your trip log into your account why is that doing that i think laura changed it today actually we'll <laughs> if she's listening are we not able to get to that calculator no, it's there. It was there. Sam login. It definitely looks different than it was. Um, so with that, it looks like we might have to do some work. It might have ended up being uh, changed up a little bit here. Josh, if you want to work on that while yeah. I move on to the examples, yeah. and we'll make sure to get that up and running. All right, so you hop on this. All right. And then I'm going to step out real quick. OK, perfect. All right, I got it from here. All right, so once we get the trip comparison calculator back and working, um, it was working this morning because I think we were all in there doing uh, different trips. Uh, and Tim, you just used it. All right, so I'm not sure exactly what happened there. Um, but we wanted to show you this. We haven't put out a hot line on it. We probably will put one out soon so you can see it. Um, but if you can look here on this first sequence, this is an IPD sequence. And um, if you look over on the left, it says time away from base. And that um, we put in 4827. That's the time away from base. There were two 50 minute boardings. So you fill this in on the calculator. Okay. 
And then this flight attendant um, was an aisle flight attendant, but if you were the purser or you were the galley, there's a drop down there for you to be able to choose uh, any of the positions. And then you go to the very bottom on the left and you fill in the amount of pay that you received for that trip. And this was 1607 for this trip. And I think this trip was a trip on my, on my screen. So to Amsterdam, correct? Yeah. And so it shows you under the JCBA what you make today, which is $1,277.72. With TA2024, you would make $1,614.51. And the difference is $350.79. It also breaks down the boarding pay percentage for you. And on this trip, it's 519 and the total percentage of wage increases. So now if you put in a full month of IPD, and this is five trips of IPD, and so the total time away from base was 276 hours and 27 minutes, 12, oh, it's six trips, I'm sorry, I think I said five. Uh, it's 12 boardings, okay? And this is a purser, this time you can fill that in, and the total pay for the month was 97.52. So as you can see here, it calculates what your wages are today, what they will be tomorrow, and then the difference for the month. And for this flight attendant, it's about $2,038 for the month difference, uh, doing the same exact trip that you're doing today. Figure it out? It should be good. Okay, that's fine. We'll come back to it in a sure. second. All right, so then we did a domestic sequence. And hang on one second, because Josh, now I can't see. Um, with the domestic sequence, same thing. This is a five hour sequence, okay? Uh, time away from base was 929. Uh, and this flight attendant lead pay was a five hour trip. And you can see the difference in these two from JCBA to TA 2024 is $157. And on this one, you can see the boarding pay as a percentage of the wages is 15%. This is a good one to highlight because so this is a five hour turn at at top pay, right? So if you if you look look at just at the boarding pay for this for this this trip, it's sixty basically sixty two dollars. When you divide that by five hours, you're basically adding twelve dollars an hour to that turn. So if you and you have to add the boarding pay to the wage. So now you're looking at basically ninety four dollars and some change per hour for that five hour turn. That's a good way to Can I answer this too? This is also operationally a good example because they had to board the first flight twice. Okay, perfect. Perfect. And the total percentage of wage increase it also has on here, which I like, um, as uh, 38.13. So uh, then let's see, we've got a full month of domestic here. And I, oh, there's a lot of trips there. Let's see. The time away from base is 112 hours. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. They're turns. Oh, they're all turns. With skew overnight. Okay. And 27 30 minute boardings. Oh, I like that. Lead pay for a total of 83.48 hours for the month. This is also 13 year uh, flight attendant, 13 years or more, right? A top out flight attendant. And as you can see, this is for the entire month. The difference is $1,900.78. And here you see the boarding pay for the month averaged out at 809. Uh, so this is all you can do this with your month uh, and figure out exactly how much more you would be paid under TA 2024. We also did it for NIPD. And uh, you can see here with the NIPD, this is a two day trip. Sorry, I'm struggling to see here today. 35 hours gone, four boardings, actually five boardings, one boarding at 35 minutes and four boardings at uh, 45 minutes. OK, galley pay on this one. And so you have some domestic and some NIPD pay for this trip. And the total difference is four hundred and five dollars. And here again, Tim. Another, another example, you take the boarding pay, you divide it by the 15 hours, you're basically roughly just under $10 an hour extra for, for boarding pay. So we got a lot of questions about that 8.2% average. You can kind of see here, depending on the trip, 
right? You're going to either be higher than 8%. Sometimes you're going to be a little bit lower. It just is going to depend on the trip that you're flying. And then we did the whole month here also for the full NAPD. I think we need to get these out on the website. Maybe we'll do a hotline with these so people, everybody can look at it. Um, and here, uh, this is a full month of NAPD. I'm guessing, yes, it has some domestic in it also. And again, the difference is $1,854 for the entire month uh, between current JCBA and TA 2024. And for the entire month, the boarding pay on this one is 1230 okay? 12.3%. All right. Uh, let's see what this one is. Is sure. this 13 years? Oh, oh, okay. Sorry. That's okay. So I was uh, flying here yesterday and I had a flight attendant, Brad, who is in the back and we got out the computer, got out my uh, computer and we did his, uh, we, we kind of did it, we rounded, right? So we did 464, he was a little bit over gone for the month, 464 hours. Um, no galley, no lead. Uh, he works high time, 147 hours. Uh, we put in the number of boardings for his month was actually 41. And for him, we did trip comparison and then we did total month comparison. And for total month comparison, it was a difference of $3,471 more he'll be making under TA 2024. And then also, if you look on the calculator, there's one more step that David has done, which I love. And it's basically the difference at the end of this contract, after you've received all the raises, how much more you'll be making from today until that last raise of three and a half percent at the beginning of the fourth year, fifth year, sorry. And that difference from today, same amount of my, same amount of hours is 5,227. So there's a lot on the website that you can use um, to, to help you determine the math of this uh, of this contract, and, and it's a good illustration to show that, as a reminder, boarding pay goes up each year as well. Just like your hourly pay, the boarding pay does increase. And here you can see it's gone from nine eighty three up to eleven hundred. Yeah, thank you, David Harshaw. We're really appreciative. I will tell you, Josh. Do you want to try and go back to the website and see if we can get in? I don't know what was going on with that. Let's see. So you have to log in first right to get to there okay that that looks like what it looks like <laughs> there we go all right so once again you'll go to the ta 2024 under tm calculators we're talking about the trip comparison calculator right now and once you log in uh you'll see this yep. and i'm going to click on click that there it'll have you log in to your Oh, God. I don't think I had to do that. Did you have to do yes, that? Yes, you do. You have to have a my mom was logged in. Okay. Gmail oh, okay, maybe we weren't quite ready for this today, Joe. Well, these are the steps that all of our members. Yeah, have to go that's through. true. All right. I must always be logged in also because I haven't had to do that. Which one? You mentioned it's an estimate. Oh yeah. Yeah. We will. Also, this is an estimate, right? And if you want, you can just make it um, round the numbers. Like I said, 464 with uh, Brad's time away from base, but it was actually 464.32 or something like that. So we just rounded it. And the, and the reason it's an estimate is because those fields that are dealing with time, they're in decimal, they're in percentages, right? Because because our HA one goes by up to sixty minutes, but those fields actually you would have to convert them to percentages if you want the exact figure. So that's where you say it's an estimate. Okay, so once you log in, you'll get to this page, and then you have to click on make a copy. Okay, and then it takes you right to the calculator. Okay, and there you just fill in the information, and you can get your your schedule for the month or your trip that you're doing so you can see the difference in pay. So just want to walk you through. Um, there are lots of calculators on there. Uh, just in case you have some spare time, uh, you can get in and play around with it. Yep. 
All right. Are there any other calculators? I think that's it. Okay. Tim, do we need to show any other calculators? Um, we've done the boarding pay calculator. I think that's good. The retro calculator we've done. We've good. pretty much done most of them. All right, let's find some of our questions that we have today. Sorry, I've got to open that back up again. Make sure I'm on the right one. I've got some live questions. Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay, well, first question was about implementation. It says, please explain the difference of TBD and the JCBA to date of signing plus six months data signing plus 12 months, et cetera, in TA 2024. Many are seeing it as the same thing, a delayed implementation. Uh, so good question. It is absolutely 100% not the same thing. I can tell you uh, for the JCBA, it, everything was pretty much uh, as soon as practical or TBD if it wasn't economic in the first six months. So we had with the JCBA six months to get pretty much all of the economic items implemented, um, which they were implemented in the first six months, but then all of the systems that we negotiated, um, our new reserve system, uh, Rota D, uh, TTS, UBL, all of those took um, a while to get uh, programmed because they were brand new systems. This is much different. Um, having a date of signing plus six months or data signing plus 12 months, these are improvements to current systems that we have today. They are not brand new systems that we have to go out there and actually figure out how they are going to work from the start. And so we were able to work with the company and especially with the IT department to see how long it would take for those improvements to our systems to get added in. So it is definitely different. We did not see dates like this, date of signing plus six or 12. I also mentioned when I was talking about implementation that we modeled it after the pilot's implementation schedule, and we've also been talking to them to see how it's working for them, and it seems to be working um, pretty good. So very different. Great question. Thank you for asking. Definitely not the same as JCBA. We initially didn't even get our first timeline for JCBA until the very end of 2016, and then that changed completely. Very different. We've got time frames already set up. And maybe we need to explain what the DOS plus six months actually is. Day of signing plus six months would be six months after September 12th, which would be March 12th. DOS plus 12 would be September 12th. Day of signing is October 1st. So you would, yeah. Me. <laughs> Did you see mine and Kelly's and Risa, all of our eyes were like, what's Jim talking about? Six months from, from that. So October 1st. Yes. yes, thank you. April 1st. It's okay, you know what? what? I think I say this at pretty much all the base visits. We've been pretty much going nonstop since I can't remember when, probably May. Um, so we're, that's why there's seven of us on the team, right? Thanks, Tim. All right. Uh, let's see here. OK, I think we already answered this next one about this, this wrap start time, so we can move past that one because we, we answered that while we're going through it. Oh, gosh, OK, uh, did we get the slide for scheduling concessions? You guys are all going to help me because I don't think I have the slide in here. So it says, what are the schedule concessions the company wanted? All right, well, I can tell you the ones that I have definitely in my head. I'll just start and then everybody can start adding in. So first and foremost, you all know well about the transition days that they wanted to go from when you were on reserve for the month. They didn't want your reserve month to end at the end of the month anymore. They wanted you to have five transition days that went into the next month, which meant five more reserve days for you in your line holder month. That was definitely a huge concession, and we definitely were never going to agree to that. And you all helped us beat that one back by all your chance at uh, all the pickets. Secondly, uh, IPD rest. So right now, you have to have 14 hours of IPD rest on your layovers. And the company wanted to match what the pilots have. They can reduce down to 10 hours. Uh, we said 100% no. Uh, we need that rest after the IPD trips. It was really important for us. They've actually been wanting this for a very long time. Um, we were able to beat back that, and we still have our, you will have 14 hours of rest 
on your IPD layovers. Uh, third, this touches a lot of our rescheduling language. So uh, one of the core parts of our rescheduling language is that unless it's to prevent a delay or a cancellation, that if they're going to reschedule a line holder, that they have to use reserves first, okay? If there are reserves available, they need to use reserves. And it's in quite a few different areas of our rescheduling language. They wanted to be able to save reserves, and so they wanted to be able to schedule, reschedule line holders before having to use the reserves at the base. Uh, we were definitely, that would have taken us a lot longer. It would have definitely been a concession. Um, it would have touched other areas like 10J7 and getting you back to base by the time you're supposed to get back. And so we are happy to report we were not, we definitely did not agree to that. Okay, who wants to spit one out? You got one that's your favorite? They wanted to re, uh, restrict reserves from being able to drop trips in yep. TV. Um, we did not allow that. Yep. So reserves can still drop their trips in ETB. Yeah, even if you're on reserve, sometimes you got to get rid of that trip right. somehow, some way. Anybody else? And they also wanted to restrict reserves picking up on their first day off yep. to um, later. I think it was noon, yep. um, but we were able to keep it at 10 a.m. There's another part to that. I know Kelly oh, always reminds me of it. Kelly, I wanted <laughs> us as a reserve that I would have to have my home base rest off of my trip I picked up on my days off done before midnight of my reserve. Yeah. It's like, no. Yeah. It, this one's personal to me because I'm at a co terminal base. They wanted to be able to. Um, Increase to three hours uh, co terminals after wrap. So if you wanted um, today, it's two hours outside the end of your wrap, they can assign you a sequence to depart. They wanted to make it three hours for assignments of sequences out assigned during your wrap, but you would report or depart uh, three hours after. And then also for standby assignment, they wanted to do it for three hours. So we, I would, that was. One personal for me that I was. <laughs> we all have the personal ones, right? To, no, we're not going to let you do that. <laughs> wanted to restrict what we could grieve in a grievance, which is something we've, we've had the ability to grieve any action of the company um, for decades. So they wanted to limit that to just contractual disputes and discipline. They also wanted to exclude standbys in 10J8. So if you're at origination and you have a delay of three hours or greater, you can say, hey, I don't want this trip anymore. And by excluding standbys, basically it would have made that uh, provision moot yeah. and it, it wouldn't really have applied. And so we were able to keep that in the language. And they wanted to remove the rescheduling language that prevents um, deferred flights. So now if you're on a trip operating Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, the departure gets moved to tomorrow and they can't get you back within the footprint of the original trip. You're removed from that trip with pay. They wanted you to be able to be forced onto that trip that would take you outside the original footprint. Yeah. Or how about when you did get removed? Remember that restriction where they wouldn't let you double dip? Oh, oh right. Yes. Yeah. No. yeah. OK, you want to? talk about that ETB one? Is that what you're talking about? I'm trying to the negation. No, like, like, so I started my sequence and now I'm getting removed for the ON removal, right? Oh, yeah. And now I go back in to pick that same trip. Oh, right, right. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. That pays take, very well. Or you just want to take that out of the contract completely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So a big part of the negotiations definitely was uh, protecting our work roles. And it's definitely something we can't take lightly. Uh, protecting the work rules that are in a contract once, I think everybody knows this by now, once you give them up, it's really hard to get them back. So great question. Thank you, Andres, for answering, uh, asking that question. Okay, uh, Tim, this looks like it has your name on it. Can you please clarify retroactive pay? Okay, do you see that question? It's number nine. The executive summary, page 14, question two says retroactive pay will be paid on all 401k eligible earnings. Does that mean it's based on salary or maximum allowable contribution to 401k by the IRS? 
if it is not salary, what is considered eligible earnings? OK, so the eligible earnings that is um, defined in the one time ratification bonus letter agreement that's already posted on the website. It basically matches the same uh, definition that they use for a profit sharing plan. So anything that you've earned from the company, wages, lead pay, um, all, of your, all the, the things that come from American that are earned, that's what goes into that, that this qualifies for retro pay. What it doesn't cover is say per diem because that's reimbursement for meals and expenses, commissions, uh, Barclays commissions, things like that. Those are not eligible for retro pay. And uh, what else? Uh, you kind of walked in on the website. You, if we show on the website exactly what they need to look yeah. at as far as what's part of the eligible earnings, right? Yeah, correct. So for the calculator, if they go to the calculator, they'll see exactly what they need the to look at on the last exactly batch. which paycheck to use, what where on the paycheck to look for that line item. It'll show your yearly total. Um, you will be able to uh, put it into your 401k if you want. There'll be a special thing for that coming out that you'll be able to see. Um, but I hope that answered your question. Yeah. All right. All right. Uh, since crew meals have been discontinued due to the retirements of the 330, why instead have they been installed due to the arriving of the LXR? Who will provide no proper crew rest? That's kind of a weird. I'm not sure I've got that question exactly right. Basically, I'm just going to talk about the crew meals. Um, so the crew meals for Charlotte and Philadelphia were part of the last uh, of the JCBA. The reason why those crew meals were still there was because the LAA, at LAA, we had a 757 crew rest seats that had hydrolocks that allowed them to recline further than regular seats, okay? And it was all, and it was curtained off. For Legacy US, they did not have those special seats on the 757. And so part of the agreement was because the company did not want to have to retrofit the seats on the LUS 757s, that agreement was to give them crew meals in exchange for that. So I know there's been like talk about the 330. I think there was a grievance about the 330 way before this, but the reason why in the JCBA, Charlotte and Philly still had those crew meals all had to do with the 757. We have no 757s any longer. We were able to capture value out of those crew meals and put it elsewhere for everyone. Um, and as well as there is a, I think what they're asking about is crew rest on the XLR. And we have been working actually for about a year and a half on crew rest on the XLR. And there will be, um, they're called croutons, in case you haven't heard of them yet. Uh, but they, you will be able to lie flat and they will also be curtained off. So crew rest, we all already have been working on for the XLR, if that was the second part of your question. Okay. Um, I'm going to, I think I already talked about number 11, so let's move to 12 and will CQ training pay be effective immediately after ratification of the TA? Actually, it will be date of signing, which we've already discussed is October 1st. So October 1st, the uh, CQ training pay and web-based training pay will take effect along with the commuter hotel rooms for Dallas-based flight attendants that live more than 50 miles from the training center. Lots of those. Okay, um, next question. I have a three-day trip December 31st through January 2nd. Will I now be paid holiday pay for all three days of the trip, not just the designated holiday incentive days December 31st and January 1st? So there was no change to the days. What was uh, changed in the TA was to capture if you originally were scheduled to touch the holiday and then due to a reschedule or cancellation or a delay, you no longer are touching the holiday, that you would still receive that holiday pay for that leg that was supposed to touch the holiday. Thanks, Wendy. Okay, I thought we were getting another year of insurance coverage if we are on a medical leave. Right now we get one year of coverage and just want to see if that was extended or not. Did anything change with taking a medical leave? 
So nothing changed. So what we have um, in the TA is the same that we have in current book. So as long as you're on a paid status, you will be on your medical benefits. Once you transition to an unpaid status, you will have that for a year before you would have to transition to COBRA. Cheryl, great question. And I, what I like about this is you can tell everyone was following along as we were negotiating, right? Yeah. This was definitely something we were trying to change. Um, we wanted this. Uh, we felt that it was really important. Um, but as you can kind of see how negotiations work, right? And I talk about this, you know, definitely at the base visits. We start high. We put everything in there that we want. The company is, as you know, 11 percent. I'm trying to remember even their first economic was 11 percent and boarding pay. That was it, right? We had 401k, I training. think, and profit sharing and training, but no per diem, no nothing else. So, you know, we start here, they start there, and we work our way through it. It's not something that, you know, we tried, I think we took this off at the very end. Oh, we were just trying to get as much value as we could into the wages. Okay, this is a long one. Okay, section 12.3, I love this though. The flight, uh, this flight attendant actually put the language in there. Reserve to line holder, line holder to reserve. Why is there no reserve to reserve? If the TA is approved, new hires will be on two years straight reserve. That is 24 months of forced reserve to reserve integration. Why are these future dues paying APFA members completely ignored in this section, not covered or protected for the first two years of their employment? I, I the question's a little confusing because the concept of integration is talking about two different groups, which is reserve to reserve is not different. It's the same. And 24 months of forced reserve to reserve integration. Remember, you're you're always subject to reserve. It's not forced on to reserve for 24 months, as we've seen in a base like Boston, yeah. where uh, flight attendants have only served a couple of months of uh, uh, straight reserve rotation and they go right to line holders. So you're always subject to reserve. I had two of my flight attendants yesterday coming in that were now in one on one off and they're like, we just bid reserve every month. It's just easier for us. That, I mean, it's so interesting now listening, okay. you know, uh, to our flight attendants. And they said once they figured out the system, right, once they learned it, then they, they said it, they, they don't then find it. I'm, I know that's not everybody though. All right, uh, let's see, let's, that's implementation. I think I've talked about that probably enough. Um, all right, why were there no improvements for speakers in the TA? Why are we allowing the company to say why UL requires a speaker, but it isn't international? Do uh, dual aisle aircraft are going out with one speaker quite often increasing the workload for the one on board. Tim, you wanna take this one? Sure. Um, so a lot of questions in here. Um, as far as allowing the company to say Montreal requires a speaker, so the company has sole discretion where they're putting speakers, what which markets they determine require a speaker or don't. Um, even within the same destinations, depending on base, sometimes they they could have one speaker say on Athens versus two at another base, depending on staffing or the makeup of the, the passengers and they have sole discretion in that. As you know, the co contract said up to uh, one per cabin to, you know, that those are up to, those are uh, maximums that are outlined in the contract. They're not minimums. They're never going to uh, agree to a minimum because if they had a minimum and we ran out of speakers, they would end up having to cancel the flight. So they're not going to agree to something like that. Um, uh, there were improvements for speakers. Um, we, as far as the, Understaffing, uh, understaffing and increased speaker pay were both on the table all throughout negotiations right up to the very end. Unfortunately, uh, as with many other things like sick and vacation, we, we could not get everything. We just could not. And uh, the, the decisions were very tough to make. Um, but the understaffing was one of those that in the speaker pay were not able to secure. Um, everything has a value. Right. Yes, everything has, everything a has a value. And I would say probably the majority of these negotiations, what we said at the table is we were trying to make sure the money got to everyone. Right. And yes, speakers, I know we've heard from some pursers, right? Some people have asked why wasn't IPD increased? 
right? We wanted to make sure that where the money went in this contract was obviously in the wages, specifically uh, boarding pay, uh, 401k increases, you know, money that touched every flight attendant on the property. Okay. Okay. In light of having a, uh, approved boarding pay during negotiations months ago, why has an AA management proactively done the necessary computer programming to make boarding pay effective on date of signing? So they uh, early on in negotiations, they were uh, willing to give us boarding pay. However, it did have a, have a caveat attached to it, which was that they wanted to eliminate boarding times, uh, the onboard requirements from the contract. Uh, we were not interested in, in eliminating boarding times from the contract. So uh, that's one piece. The other piece is that they don't really start any programming of any of these items until the agreement's ratified because uh, if it's not ratified, you know, it, it may never come to be. It may not end up in the next, you know, uh, TA or future TA. So they're not going to waste resources programming things that may or not come to fruition. Uh, the same team that's programming our things have other responsibilities in the company, programming for pilots, et cetera. So um kind of goes back to what I talked about is they're they're not gonna they're gonna right now they're in we're all in discussions about these items, right? But the actual work for it isn't gonna start until the TA is actually ratified. Okay. I love this next question, actually. I remember in the last town hall hearing that the 30-day voting window is embedded into APFA's constitution. You heard it, that's correct. However, if there's a 100% vote return well before 30 days, or if an overwhelming majority of the APFA membership voted yes, that even if every other outstanding vote voted no, that the yes vote would still pass, could there be an exception on the 30-day waiting period? I think somebody wants this to get in. <laughs> Um, love the question. Definitely it is. Um, it's part of our constitution. It has to be open for a, a minimum of 30 days. Um, we do not know how anyone has voted until the vote closes, just to make sure everybody completely understands that. Um, it is not something that we're going to be looking at how many voted yes and how many voted no. We will not know until what's the date? September 12th. Um, yeah, 12th, 12th, yeah. 12th. Thursday, September 12th. September 12th, yes. yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, which, which is the date of ratification. There we go. So great question. I love the question. Um, and if 100% voted, wow, like I would be, that would be great if everybody, I can tell you with strike authorization vote, how big was the team of people that we had calling flight attendants, reminding them, you know, it's a lot of work to get everybody to vote, but we've made it as easy as we possibly can for you to vote for this. Um, just have to go to the website. Don't wait for anything in the mail. Um, I wish all of our elections could be that way, um, but great question. It's still going to have to be the 30 days. All right, let's see here. Okay. I might have missed this in regards to boarding pay. Will there be any company imposed must have policies such as you are now being paid to board an aircraft, so you must help lift bags in an overhead bin. Always do it or always do a pre-departure beverage regardless of delay. Uh, Tim, you want to take that? Yeah. So, <laughs> um, no, so they, they can't, you know, first of all, lifting bags, that's already, we already have contractual language on that. You never have to lift a bag if you feel it injure you. So that's already contractual. Pre-departures, that's part of our, our job duties. As a reminder, from the time you sign in until the end of your debrief, we're on duty, which means we are we are guaranteed a minimum of pay. That's how they get uh, that's how they get by with assigning us duty. So and from the minute you're signed in until the end of your debrief every day, even though we're not earning our full hourly rate of pay, which we should be, or we'd like to, that you Next are, contract. Yeah, yeah. You are, <laughs> you are, we are earning a minimum yeah. of pay, which is how that, uh, so you are responsible now for that. I'm just going to add into that because you add, you brought it up. Because we definitely hear from flight attendants who say, you know, I think we should be paid from the minute we report, right? Meaning they're saying they're hourly wages, right? Or full hourly pay for boarding pay. And we agree 100%. We definitely would like, but you have to understand 
since we haven't been paid that for all these years. Bringing that into the contract, you can see there's a high cost to that item, adding it in. Now you can improve upon it in future negotiations, maybe get full pay for the entire boarding or pay half pay from the time you reported. But for this contract, we needed to make sure that we got the wages as high as we possibly could. And by adding more to the boarding pay, more time, that would have it would have had to come from somewhere else. And it has to allow to pay for part of the job, which is the most difficult yeah. effort, oftentimes. And you know, but I do have, I have conversations with different players to say we should be getting paid every hour we're on duty. But if you think about it, I might have a 12 hour day, Julie might have a 12 hour day, but she's got a 10 hour flight. And half of my day is spent sitting in the airport in between flights. So one, she's working the full time flying. The other, I'm working six hours and sitting in the airport six hours, maybe reading a book, maybe sleeping and off. So that that's the difficulty in it, but that boarding pay element does add a, a different sort of way of, of compensating us for really the most difficult part of our job. Obviously. As well as the sit rig, same thing. Yeah, same we thing. added in more money for when we're sitting around exactly. and our flights are delayed. Uh, so, or when it's even scheduled and it goes, you know, past the two and a half hours that you're actually sitting there. So, um, but it's a step in the right direction. That's for sure. All right, why does the company need four months notice of retirement to set up the RHRA? Well, this is going to be a couple of things. Um, the first, um, it, it's going to fall to manpower planning. It, by having that four months, it, it does give the company some uh, leeway and setting up schedules and having a basis on how many employees are um, on the property at the time as they build uh, lines and sequences for the, the upcoming months. Um, so this four months will give them that, that opportunity to know where those people are coming from um, within the system, what bases are losing those people as they as they move into retirement. Um, additionally, it falls into clerical. Um, they, the company to maintain an RHRA, um, they do have to comply with governmental laws and tax laws um, that fall um, to maintaining that RHRA. So to um, ensure that they are meeting any changes or updates to that, um, this four months also gives them that advantage um, uh, and those are in that regard to keeping up with uh, those changes. Thanks, Brian. OK, I submitted this question during the first town hall, but never heard it addressed. I'm still a displaced commuter, so you must be Los Angeles based because I think that's the only place we have displaced flight attendants today. And I recall during the negotiations town halls, there was discussion of getting jump seats removed from weight restrictions so that we could still ride on if a flight attendant flight got restricted. What happened to that? Because I never saw even a mention of it when the TA came out, but that was something I was really hoping we could get. Other airlines allowed jump seats on weight restricted flights. So we did, uh, through these negotiations, we were working on completely removing the weight restriction. Um, we were not able to achieve that. But what we have done is, um, and I'm not sure if you saw, there was a, I believe we put out a hotline as well as the company put out information regarding the pilots were able to negotiate in their contract that if the captain works with, I'm trying to think of it, uh, is that? Dispatch, thank you. Um, that, you know, even if it's weight restricted, they can work on the load factors and all of that, the fuel to be able to allow uh, flight, flight attendants and pilots on the jump seats. Now, the pilot said flight deck jump seat, but our language currently says that if the pilots get any more favorable language in this area, it would also apply to the flight attendants and so we grieved it and we have resolved it with the company and that's when the company did put out uh, their communication to the flight attendants that basically says they can't jump through boarding priority so if you're listed above a pilot and the captain is able to change it so that he can get someone on the uh, jump seats that they can't skip over the flight attendants and go to the pilot first. You would have to get on that flight also. 
uh, meaning you would have you would go first, and then if they could get two on, then it would be the flight attendant and then the pilot. So um, we have been able to resolve that through our grievance process. Uh, I think maybe we should put out some more information about it um, if you, were, you did not see it, but that was resolved. Okay. Is there any change to the way ODANs are paid, Kelly? There is not. The only thing that we changed on the ODANs was just to take into account the 10 hour rest um, on the outside of it, but ODANs have not been changed how they're created or how they will be paid. Okay. When picking up out of base, will we get a secured ticket or will, will we have to non rev Hell, you're going to take that one. Um, I would suggest when picking up out of base that you ensure that you are positioned where you need to be for that sequence because you will not be afforded any type of positive space company travel outside the constraints of the contract, um, nor are you covered under the commuter policy. You pick it up, it's yours, yeah. right? Okay. And no backseat. Uh, this is a question from a Phoenix flight attendant. Rotating reserve in the high seniority bases, such as Phoenix and Los Angeles, continues to be a hot topic for flight attendants with 35 to 40 years of seniority. Why wasn't this tackled with this TA to prevent flight attendants over 35 years of seniority to not have to serve reserve? All right, well, listen, uh, when it comes to reserve, as far as the uh, rotation is concerned. We did do surveys, right? And we've um, also worked with our base presidents on this because this was definitely a really hot topic um, early on in these negotiations. It kind of went from every base had senior flight attendants on, this was during COVID, a little bit after COVID, to just Los Angeles and Phoenix. And a lot has to do with what happened with those bases because of COVID. So. In negotiations, um, what we looked at was first off improving the reserve system, which you can tell by everything Reese went through today. And I think we even didn't put all of the improvements in there, um, but we made a lot of improvements to the reserve system that we currently have to make it more livable, to have a better quality of life. We also looked at how how can we help to have less of a dependence on these high uh, reserve percentages? Because in Phoenix, you know, there are times when, especially Phoenix, and I will say Charlotte, your reserve percentage is much higher than the rest of the bases. And um, a lot of that has to do with how many flights go through Phoenix, go through Charlotte, um, and the trips that actually fall apart. But um, as far as making a change to today to who is on reserve at the base, that would mean that flight attendants who are currently based there would have to go onto straight reserve, right? In order to actually bring the reserve seniority down. What the focus is, I will say for Phoenix, it's slowly working is getting all of the PORs back, which I believe Phoenix has all the priority of returns back. And now for Phoenix, it will be bringing in hopefully vacancy transfers. And this is, listen, your base president has worked really hard on this. Um, I have seen a lot of what she's put out to the base. I've also been here when she's had meetings with high level management and has been working with them to try as hard as she could to get more flight attendants into your base. And it's slow, it's not as fast as everybody wants it to, to be, but you are at the point of where the majority of your flight attendants, you know, who are on the list, who want to get into Phoenix have been able to get there. Now, hopefully we'll get some vacancy transfers in soon. LA is a little bit different of a story. Um, we do not see, you know, we have a long list of displacements for the Los Angeles base. Um, I think last I looked, Wendy, was about 200 flight attendants, somewhere around there, and we haven't been able to get those flight attendants in. That is going to require work, um, constant engagement with the company to try and make that happen, um, but it isn't something that we're going to be able just to change by changing 
the reserve rotation because don't forget we have to have 28,000 members here vote on this TA and they have to be okay with whatever the rotation or straight reserve is and we heard loud and clear from our flight attendants who are here on property that they did not want to be in a sense go on to straight reserve um, for those that are on property. Uh, for those that aren't on property, we've also heard loud and clear from a lot of flight attendants that they don't want to see straight reserve either. So um, it's complicated. I would say Phoenix is kind of on the way. It's very slow. Um, Los Angeles, there's still work to do. But when we looked at reserve, we definitely looked at trying to make it as uh, the best system we possibly could. I can tell you out of all the carriers, all the flight attendant unions, we are the only flight attendant union or airline that you actually can bid for and be awarded trips by your seniority. The other uh, reserve systems out there are a preference type system, which we have experience with that in our past, which really didn't work. Um, and so we weren't, you know, we definitely feel our system is a great system and we just made it um, even better. So um, I know we got to get there, though. Um, really appreciate the question. I know this is a hot topic for LA and Phoenix, um, and we will continue the work to try and help those two bases so that we can get the seniority down. Part of that is let's keep working on that reserve percentage and getting that reserve percentage down, and that brings the seniority down. Okay. Will there be changes to GTS and being blocked out of our schedules nightly? like the old days of access to our schedules 24 seven and instant open time trades, Tim. No, there will be. Um, the, the reason that TTS has to shut down and don't have access to your schedule is because if people could be dropping trips, trading trips with uh, that were balloted, it would screw up the whole, you know, chains and, and all that. And, and more than that, the um, remember these were targeted negotiations and we were working off of things that were identified as priorities to the membership and the base presidents. Overhauling systems, whether it be TTS, UBL, ETB, or reserve, overhauling the systems was not something identified by the membership or the base presidents. So the answer is no. Hey, thanks, Tim. Completely different system, right? Completely different. Okay. In 41 years of flying, I have never heard the term deadhead stand up. I find many IPDs and with dead head legs. Oh, I want those trips, um, but I have never heard this term. I have read the section of the TA referring to dead head stand up, but I still am clueless as to what this is. Please explain in simple language and give us examples of this new terminology and amendment to the TA. So this basically means you're deadheading from point A to point B. And the company needs you to stand up and work that deadheading flight rather than deadhead. So I'm scheduled to go Miami to Boston. And during the course of my trip, uh, they, they, they need to uh, somebody to work that 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 segment of the trip. I'm on the I'm on the NS as a deadheader. With this language, they'll be able to stand me up to work that particular flight only doesn't subject me to other rescheduling. They can use me to work that flight only. It doesn't change any of the other existing rules today for waiving your, your final deadhead, any of that. They, today, even if you're on a multi-day multi trip, and your last day is one leg home, you're able to be rescheduled all through that trip until the end of your last working leg, meaning the leg you actually worked in the aisle. That final deadhead, once, once that last leg is completed, you, if you want to go on a different flight, you go to the agent, you stand by as a revenue standby. Once you have your seat, you call up and say, hey, I'm just letting you know I'm waving my, my dead head. That process doesn't change with the, with the new language, but the new language does allow them to stand up someone who is deadheading to work that flight, but they can, it, it only takes place after you've reported for your sequence up until the end of the last leg worked. Okay. Is anything? I think they got it. You got it. OK, you guys, Morgan, do you want to say something else? I was going to say, you know, as we've talked about throughout um, this presentation and throughout the entire process, all of 
a lot of what we did was to conserve reserves in the event in the intention to reduce the company's reliance on reserves to uphold the operation because if you're reserves that are being used, the lower the reserve percentage, the lower the reserve seniority becomes over time. And currently, if reserves are being sent all over the system to work these segments when there's dev headers on board that could work them, um, we're not using our reserves efficiently. And then there have been a lot of questions of confusion about, you know, is this going to cause them not to release us at the end of our trips? Or we're, And that nothing has changed with that. First of all, as a line holder, you're not asking to be released for that deadhead, right? You're notifying them of what you're doing. If you're a reserve, obviously you do have to request release. So that those two things have not changed. You still, at the end of that last leg worked, that's when you notify them of your of what you're doing for that final deadhead. Um, today, the language says notify prior to the deadhead. So some people do call up earlier than the last leg worked, and notify them, but you still are on the hook with the company until the end of that last leg work that okay. today and as well as going forward. OK, we're going to switch over to the live questions from today and um, those were the pre submitted questions. So if you guys can just go to that tab. OK, Tim, you're back up regarding 401k. Can you go back to the company to have them update the percentages on the date of signing? 401k is not a brand new item. It should not take until 1125 to implement the race. Uh, that would be great, but no, we cannot go back to the company. The the January 1st time line was taken into account with the valuation of that item. As well, they do need time. There's plan documents that have to be updated. Uh, ours is actually pretty quick. We're getting it implemented in three and a half months. Um, the pilots and their recent TA they ratified in August. They did not uh, see an increase to their 401k until May of the following year, which is May of 2024. They got 1%, and then two years later, they're getting another percent. So we're getting the full three and a half within three and a half months, which is pretty good. OK, thanks, Tim. OK, this is implementation. OK, hello all. Two things I thought were great improvements to scheduling were out of base pickup and trip improvement uh, day before on UBL, trip improvement day before on UBL. What do we call that? Once better uh, or UBL trip improvement. UBL trip improvement. <laughs> Although I understand programming takes time, I don't see any implementation dates for these two items. These greatly improve our flexibility. I agree. When is a realistic expectation to have these available to us? Um, these are the six items that I spoke of earlier when we were talking about the implementation. Those two are in those six items. And the kick has 90 days to come up with an implementation timeline that's realistic. But also what's part of that is the priority. What should come in first? What should come in second? It looks like by this flight attendant um, that she, we know what she wants first and second. Um, but it is, you know, they'll take into effect, like let's say that um, UBL trip improvement is a really small size project, right? And they think they can get that in pretty quickly. It, it probably will go to the top of the list, right? Because it, we will look at the size of the project and prioritize based on size and also what we feel is most important. So believe me, we all want to get these in. Improving our flexibility is really important to us. Um, and I think that we have a much different process than we did the last time to see these items implemented much quicker. OK, how will ECS work? Will there be a specific app or phone number created? We don't know exactly how it will work yet. We had high level meetings with IT at the company. Uh, the good thing is that the pilots are working on their own ECS system now, so hopefully they'll be the guinea pigs. And when we get a system, uh, it'll some of the bugs will be worked out. It was important for us, though, to make sure that it's a two way communication, right? You'll always get a, a receipt or, res or a response from crew schedule. All of the responses uh, or messages you send will be time and date stamped and saved for 90 days so that you're not screenshotting your life away. But this is also will be part of the work of the KIF, the Contract Implementation Committee, to make sure um, we have a product that is 
reliable. We've seen glitches in a lot of the products that American turns out. We want to make sure that we get a product that is reliable. There is contractual language that at your choice, you could have whatever system app or phone, whatever the text phone notice on your own device, if that's compatible. So um, it's in the works. Thanks, Susan. OK, will we be able to see our seniority prior to Rota running like a report to see everyone bidding Rota the next day so that we can get an idea of if we will get our top choice? What a great idea. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is something that we have um, have language agreed to. The report that you're talking about itself is something that will be handled by the contract implementation committee to kick. Um, because it's a new implemented thing from the language that we have negotiated. But um, the idea is, yes, the reserve will have some uh, way to see all of the information before bidding in Rota. Let's just talk a little bit about the transparency that we've added, sure. um, because that definitely was a huge priority for us. We've heard this from our reserves for quite a while, especially when it comes to standby mm -hmm. um, and real time. So we've definitely added that in uh, to the contract. Is there anything you want to say more about it or? I think so. I mean, we, yeah, we heard that that was an important thing. We were able to add um, more transparency where we could with different reports, particularly the, the new um, standby report that will be available when you're on standby, similar to how you can follow the daily call up report today, you'll be able to follow some sort of report that looks similar um, for those that are on standby to see um, who's coming on next, where the ones that are on right now are, are they boarding, were they assigned a sequence? Um, and that's also helpful information if you are a strategic reserve bidder, you can kind of see like historically, for, you know, the last month, which standby shifts get used most often or which ones don't get used. So the more information reserves have, um, I think the better. There was a screen I think I heard about all the time. What was, do you remember the number? Screen 18. Screen 18. <laughs> Why can't we have screen 18? Um, so we're trying, we're, we're getting there, yeah. right? Better transparency. All right, uh, next question. Can crew schedule add extra standby shifts after Rota runs? Yes, they can. Uh, they can do that today. There's no changes with that. Um, but the important thing is that now, because they have to release which standby shifts are going to be run through Rota, you'll know ahead of time which ones are going to be in Rota for the next day. Um, but they just like today can add extra standby shifts after the road run if they um, if something changed, you know, maybe a hurricane is suddenly happening and they need more uh, standbys available to cover those last minute trips. A bunch of line holders set off their trips. Yes, this is delay. Exactly. Yep, exactly. OK, uh, Wendy, do we officially have a maximum of 10 hours behind the door? No, we current the current contract is eight hours behind the door, which we did not change. And what the 10 hours is, is a 10 hour rest, which is from release to report. And that is an FAR. So that did not change. Uh, do you see health insurance increase? Tim, in your crystal ball, do you see it increasing? <laughs> in health insurance? <laughs> Most likely, yes. Uh, in our contract, the health insurance uh, can go up with medical inflation. We did not change any of that language, but as you know, healthcare premiums have been going up every year and pretty steadily around 9, 10% for the last several years. Uh, those rates are supposed to come out September 16th. Um, they are shared with all the unions at the same time, and American is being tight lipped. But, um, but yes, I mean, premiums most likely will go up. But they did not, have, it has nothing to do with our contract in the sense nothing was changed in this contract regarding how premiums are calculated. Um, maxims, none, none of that changed in this language. And all the unionized workforce um, here at American pretty much have the same language as far as they have insurance is concerned. Very, it's very, pretty very much similar some uh, across the board. OK. Oh, this retro pay. There seems to be confusion on retro pay. Is all of August hours included in retro or just the advance till August? Yeah, this but so 
when you're looking at your retrobate, it's always best to look at the actual letter of agreement that's on the website. If you ever have questions about what's included, um, but basically it's the earnings that were paid in those time periods. So earnings paid in 2020, 21, 22, 23, and then earnings paid from January 1st to the end of August. So if you got a paycheck starting January 1st to the end of August 31st this year, those paychecks, those earnings and those paychecks, that's what the retro is calculated. So don't think about when you earned it, think about when you got paid. So any pay, paid hours, I'm sorry, anything paid from January through the end of August, that is what's gonna be in the retro for this year. So it will include that end of August check. And as you know, the end of August check is for 37 and a half hours advance of your August hours. So that will be included for the retro. There is going to be a portion that is not going to be included in the retro, um, but that is also factored in when we do valuations as far as uh, retro pay and as far as the new wages are concerned. So. OK, will you keep us updated to how the vote is going? The percent of yes and no. No, we will not do that. We do not know until the vote is done on September 12th at 12 noon. Now, it won't take us very long. Uh, because this is an electronic voting, so you will know probably within an hour or two, right, Josh, um, from noon on September 12th what the outcome is. Um, but we do not know what, we will not be able to see it as a union how many voted yes or no for the contract. Until that time. Until that date. Yeah. Okay. That one I think we already answered. If I am out on an IOD, how will that affect my retro pay? So if you're getting, if you had salary continuance, anything that was paid by American to you in your check, that would qualify for the retro pay. But any payments from Sedgwick, that would not be included in the retro pay. Okay. And can retro come earlier than 60 days from date of ratification? There's nothing from stop the company. <laughs> I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't place the bet on the demand, but uh, it has to be. It's a one-time payment, tax at the flat rate of 22%, yeah. and it has to be done within 60 days of ratification. Okay, will there be retro for recently retired flight attendants? There will not be retro for recently retired flight attendants, unfortunately. Okay, so you have to be on the property. You have to be on the property on the date of ratification, on the system seniority list, on the date of ratification, as well as employed by American on the date of payment. So you have both things to qualify. Can we try and raise the reserve guarantee? Um, so we did try. Um, if you followed along, um, we were not able to secure it. And what we did instead, which we talked about earlier in the presentation, is added elements of pay that'll pay above the guarantee. So while the guarantee will stay 75, there are going to be additional ways to earn pay above that, um, like boarding pay, sit time break, um, picking up on TTS and UBL. And really the reason that the reserve guarantee did not increase is because it's tied to the reserve calling out of time. Today, that reserve calling out of time is 8501. Um, had we increased the guarantee, the reserve calling up time would have increased as well. So we didn't want um, to increase that in, well, when we increase the guarantee. What yeah. did I get it out? 100. 100. And they get, so their guarantee is 78, but they, their calling out of time is, I think it's 100. 100 hours, right? So yeah, I mean, now reserves can hopefully call out of time and have days to be able to pick up at the end of the month if they want to make. Mm -hmm. More, more relaxed. Okay. Uh, what are the improvements for IROPS? So the main improvement for IROPS um, is related to ECS. Um, we recognize today that um, flight attendants are unable to get their rescheduling information because the phone lines get tied up during irregular operations because so many different people are calling in. Um, and so they're stranded and they're unsure what they're supposed to do. Um, but now with ECS, there's going to be access to that information. Those, you know, in the 
notifications will be sent out to the flight attendants. Um, so they'll know what their expectations are for their rescheduling. And so that'll help get information. And so you won't feel stranded any longer. Um, we also have a new hotel penalty pay that will pay anytime um, there is a rescheduling, a cancellation, or a scheduling change, which necessitates a hotel room. Um, you'll be able to get uh, pay for that if you're not given notification of that hotel within a timely fashion. Thanks. BCS, I think, will help not be waiting on the phone. Exactly. Forever. Yeah, right. Okay, Josh, I see you added your name to one of these. And someone else must have. I did not. I didn't know you were answering <laughs> questions today. I didn't know either, but here we are. <laughs> Do you think you can answer that one? I'd be happy to. Is there a formula to calculate how many boardings a month I would have to do to make my hourly rate that month match the hourly plus boarding um, rate scale? So we have a calculator on the APFA website. I'm going to show you guys how to um, get to that calculator. And this calculator is really great for um, kind of getting an idea of what you could make with boarding pay. Um, so let me share the screen. So under TA 2024, back under TA calculators, we actually have two. The boarding pay examples gives you uh, three different schedules and um, you're able to, to see what those schedules would make in boarding pay. But we're gonna go to the boarding pay calculator. And once you log in, so let me log in real quick. After logging in, uh, this calculator will pop up and what you'll do is you'll go through the various drop downs. Um, one thing you might consider doing is looking at your current month schedule and counting up the amount of boardings for each of these categories and you can put them in here. Um, we'll go with like six, a handful here, and then you select your years of service on the left hand side. And then um, once you finish filling out the rest of the, the columns, it'll calculate what your boarding pay would look like for that month. And then combining that with your new hourly wage, um, you can get a more accurate uh, depiction of what your pay may look like going forward. Thanks, Josh. Sure. OK, I'm going to address this one. How did that the strike thread even work when we couldn't even get a 30 day release with all the support and effort we did have. The company didn't have an actual threat until a 30 day cooling off period accurately occurred, which it did not. Um, we absolutely, all of the effort that was put in by all of the flight attendants here, as far as showing not just this company, but the government that we were ready to go on strike, 100% worked. It was able, it's how we were able to add 1.4 billion dollars into this contract in the last month and a half that we were negotiating. Everybody knew the flight attendants at American were ready and really wanted to go on strike. And believe me, if we would not have been ready and if all of you would not have shown up um, with all of your red lanyards, your red pins, your bag tags, um, shown up at the pickets in the media constantly, um, it, this would look different. That absolutely 100% worked. They felt the threat of a release. And when we were in DC this week, we talked about this a little bit more. At the base visits, we get into more discussion about this. But one of the last weeks we were there, it wasn't just our CEO who was in Washington, DC at the White House and at the government. It was also United's CEO as well as Deltas, they were all there because of the threat of a release for us. And so I don't want anybody on this property to think that was all for naught. It 100% helped us to get the agreement done. It helped us to get so much government involvement that we had in these negotiations. And it definitely helped us to add more money to this contract than this company ever wanted to spend on the flight attendants. So. I understand how you could possibly think, hey, we never got released, but the threat of that release definitely 
helped us. And I will tell you the weekend we were there before the 4th of July, that threat was very real. So um, I appreciate all that our members have done. I'm so proud of this membership and you should be proud of yourselves for showing up and doing everything that was asked of you because that's why we are where we're at today. Um, without that, this will look different. Okay, we have time for a couple more. Does anybody see one in there that they think really we've got to answer? Because we do have flights to catch today. We're headed to Philadelphia. Um, let's see here. Okay, <laughs> with yep. that, we will end it. Um, I hope you'll come out to the base visits because I will say um, we do get into more uh, at the base visits than we can do here in a town hall. Uh, we have Dan Akins, our economist with us. We also have Joe Burns, our lead negotiating attorney with us. They definitely give a lot more of the flavor of what happened uh, the last couple of months that we were negotiating. And it is, um, it's important for everybody to realize how much these negotiations um, changed because of the 28,000 who were definitely a part of it and definitely ready to go on strike. So thank you for that. Hopefully we answered some of your questions that you needed answered today. We will take these questions and look at probably um, some hotlines that we probably need to get out. I'm really thinking that uh, retro pay, we're still getting lots of questions about retro pay. Maybe we put out a hotline on that um, and kind of really hone in on uh, making sure everybody understands how it works. Um, we will have another town hall next Tuesday. Uh, we have another week of base visits after that. Um, and then we'll see where we're at at the end of not this week, the end of next week, and maybe add a few more town halls if we feel it's necessary. Or we'll just get out in the bases and start answering questions. So thank you for your time today. We really appreciate you tuning in with us and you asking the questions. It's really important. Um, we want to make sure that when you vote, it's an informed vote. So thank you very much and fly safely. Thank you. Thank you.